again, this is Jennifer Niem, and welcome to the second session of today's webinar series. The speaker for this session is no other than our very own MNH Director, Dr. Juan Carlos T. Gonzalez, and to introduce him is his esteemed colleague, Dr. Letitia Afuang, Professor at the Institute of Biological Sciences, College of Arts and Sciences, and MNH Curator for Amphibians and Reptiles. So may we now call on Dr. Leticia Afuang. Hello, am I heard? Am I uh, audible? Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am, loud and clear. Okay. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Jen, for that. Um, happy 44th anniversary for MNH. Uh, before I introduce our special guest speaker, I would like to remind you of the house rules. First, make sure that your audio is on mute and your video is turned off. Second, the Zoom chat may only be used for sending questions. A rapporteur will collate the questions for screen sharing later. Do not use it for sending greetings or chatting with participants. Observe proper webinar etiquette. Now, it is indeed my pleasure to introduce Dr. Juan Carlos Gonzalez, our esteemed director, who will be speaking on a very cute title, Don't Touch the Birdie, Avian Zoonosis. Dr. Juan Carlos Gonzalez is MNH current curator for birds and currently Professor 11 of Zoology at the Animal Biology Division of the Institute of Biological Sciences, College of Arts and Sciences, UPLB. Doc JC obtained his Doctor of Philosophy in Zoology at Edward Gray Institute for Field Ornithology and St. Anne's College, University of Oxford in 2012 through the support of the Ford Foundation International Fellowship Program. He earned his master's degree in 1992 here in UPLB and the BS Zoology 1997 also here in UPLB. JC's research interests include the following, ornithology, wildlife biology, conservation biology, vertebrate systematics, and phylogeography, tropical evolutionary ecology, and also ethno-ornithology. He was a visiting lecturer and professor and museum curator at the Sichuangbana Tropical Botanical Garden, Chinese Academy of Sciences in 2018. A visiting lecturer, professor, and museum curator at the Kansas Natural History and Biodiversity Institute, Kansas in 2018 also. And a visiting fellow at the Department of Ecology, Philippines University Marburg in 2015. He is recipient of the 2018 outstanding UPLB Alumni for Biodiversity Conservation and Education. And 2011, the National Academy of Science and Technology Outstanding Young Scientists Award for Zoology. In 2008, UPLB Outstanding Teacher Award for Biological Sciences. In 2002, CAS Outstanding Alumni for Extension. And in 1992, the Luis C2 Escoy Memorial Award for Best Undergraduate Thesis in Wildlife Biology and Systematics. A truly multi-awarded guy he is. Great scientist. He is a member of the Biodiversity Conservation Society of the Philippines and the Mindoro Biodiversity Conservation Foundation, where he became an official, actually vice president and trustee. Aside from this, he is involved in the DA BIFAR Philippine Aquatic Red List Committee, DNR Philippine Red List Committee for Wild Fauna, Philippine Red List Committee Technical Working Group, serving as chair for the Birds Group, Avian Group, the NASTP Philippines, Philippine Science Heritage Center Steering Committee, and the DNR Region 4A Calabar Zone Regional Cave Committee. In fact, there, is, there are a lot more to speak about Dr. JC. We cannot contain what he has achieved so far, even at his young age. So I salute this uh, scientist, this colleague. It is indeed my honor to introduce him. 
So without further ado, let's listen to his um, sharings for today. Welcome, Dr. JC. It is your time. Thank you, Ma'am Nettie. I thought I were going to do a webinar on my CV. <laughs> Thank you for that introduction. I also like to congratulate uh, Dr. Letty Afuang, UP Scientist One. <laughs> yeah, he is also UP Scientist One. Sorry, I forgot. <laughs> So congratulations to both of us. Um, yeah, thank you. So today I will be talking about um, avian zoonosis. Yeah, it was a, a, little touch, a little pun on the, the title. Actually, I wanted to put up Don't Touch My Birdie, but I will. it's a little too <laughs> unacceptable. So on, on the pun of the song. OK, so I'll share my. So again, good morning. Yeah, good morning, but good morning, everyone. Um, this is the second of our set of webinar series. Um, so I will be talking about avian zoonosis. I'm sharing this talk with my esteemed friend, um, Dr. Emiliana Elastica Turner, who helped me a lot in putting up a lot of data, especially from the Philippines. So I'm not a veterinarian, I am an ornithologist. So it's, it's a good collaboration between ornithology and veterinary medicine. Um, although I am, I wanted to go to medicine, I had to choose the academe as my career, as, as most biologists do. Um, so to start off, this is a Philippine frog mouth. Uh, it's not for you to, to, to scare you, it's a very beautiful bird. It's just a nice sample to, to kind of open up with this talk. There are actually some birds which are a little bit scary, uh, especially for people who have super, uh, a lot of superstitions. So for us, we are very superstitious as Filipinos. Um, there's a lot of omens attached for us birds, although ethnoornithology is not enough to document all the cultural differences in our, uh, that we have in terms of uh, differentiating the omens of birds around the Philippines. There's a few. Uh, generally, for us, the uwak or the crow, we often see it as because it's a black bird, as a dark omen. But for some uh, cultures, it's actually one crow is for luck. If you see five crows, then there might be sickness. If you had another one, six crows, then there might be death. So owing to this seriousness of the pandemic that we have, uh, a lot of people often foresee animals as omens. Actually, in the Philippines, there is a tribe in Palawan that thinks of the Palawan hornbill as an omen. If it lands upon uh, their house, there is something that will happen to that house. So it might be calamity or death. It's the same thing with the, the ground hornbill in Africa. Um, when they see the ground hornbill, it's, it's an omen for death. Um, so for those who want to be a swan in Swan Lake, there is another superstition about dreaming of a white swan and that might be equal to death. So we do now have different symbolisms for birds, um, especially now if you see a waterfowl and it's sickly, you often think about, I know, how many bird flu yan, so there, you always think about those things nowadays with all the changes in terms of potentials of zoonosis. Since I will be starting that talk on zoonosis, um, for us, two other speakers who will be talking about bat and even um, primate zoonosis later on. Um, I have to define it properly. So a zoonotic disease is a infectious pathogen or disease uh, that can be passed on from a non-human animal. You should avert the uh, to humans, of course. So it's one from animals to humans. I'll go to the definitions a bit further at, towards the end of the talk. Um, spelling wise, zoonosis is singular, zoonosis is plural. So, um, my talk is just more of an overview of avian diseases um, generally and that are known to be transmittable to humans. Uh, a, a bit of anecdote on some which we think or not are actual zoonosis. Um, I've gone through a lot of literature, um, interesting about those differences in terms of uh, what are actually. Uh, specific to birds and that actually just jumped to humans. 
Um, there's a, a differences in terms of transmission. There are several types of pathogens, often includes even uh, parasitic ecto and endoparasitic organisms that, of course, causes the disease. There are, of course, known cases in the Philippines, and that is, I think, will be the focus of our talk and um, implications to both birds and humans. And yes, if you see three seagulls fly overhead, uh, that is an omen of death. So there are several main transmission routes. Um, it can be direct or indirect contact with birds or their products, uh, fecal matter, secretions, or on something on, from the feathers, or something which is vector-borne, um, usually through an ectoparasite, a tick, a mite, or even uh, a mosquito. There are also says, as, other associated transmission, which of course are indirect, um, often are food-borne. So if you eat contaminated eggs or contaminated poultry meat, um, you may have allergic responses, for example, from the bites, either directly from a scratch or a bite of the bird or through their ectoparasites of mites and ticks. Um, the transmission can be either fecal, oral, as aerosols or as spores coming from those aerosols, and of course, even from contaminated surface that the birds have used. So, um, can be reading all these rich and like, ah, oh, I'm um, just uh, the, uh, whether direct or indirect contact. And that actually is what we are in this pandemic, being a little bit paranoid on surfaces. So with direct contact with birds, often that's associated with certain areas, such as households, if you have uh, pets or pet birds that I do now, um, I have a pair of lovebirds, African lovebirds, um, or if you are a bird enthusiast, you have feeders, that you of course get in contact to regulate in your garden, um, you go to pet shops, to go to bird fairs, trade, uh, trade fairs, and also there's bird markets, especially in Asia, there are recognized bird markets. And also if you are a uh, personnel uh, working or visiting a zoo, an aviary, or work in a poultry farm. There's also that a contact in terms of international trade, especially if you're moving certain animals uh, through airports or, or um, ports. Um, and then if you are a, of course, a doctor of uh, veterinary medicine, you have a clinic, and of course there are rescue centers. And for us ornithologists, um, field work. So if you always handle birds when you think about the mist nets for bird banding or for handling or for measuring and doing morphometric analysis. Then you have the vector-borne transmission. So you have no direct contact with a bird. Of course, that would be either through their ectoparasites, which sometimes um, fall off from either from the nest or from an area where the birds are, and then it fall in on yourself, and then you'll get the mites or the ticks, and they will uh, uh, feed on you, and of course, that will be transmitted to you. But then you have, of course, mosquitoes, especially the Culex mosquitoes, which, of course, are well-known for the West Nile virus. So yes. There are several kinds of contact, as you see with Mamretti here, having direct contact with a eclectus parrot. So th there are several types of zoonotic diseases. They've broken it down into five different groups, uh, which includes microbial pathogens, such as bacteria, viruses, and microfungi. And there are uh, the endo and, and ectoparasitic organisms, such as protozoa, um, the acari, which are the mites and ticks, and then worms, nematodes, uh, known to cause the disease and, of course, infect both wild and domestic birds, but have been documented to impact on humans. So there's five, again, five groups, viral, bacterial, fungal, protozoal, and, of course, external parasitics. And there's actually one paper that says that um, birds and their droppings can carry over 60 transmittable diseases. So uh, puts on edge. So it's widely recognized, and then uh, the, the coverage of these zoonotic diseases is, uh, includes the widely recognized and highly pathogenic diseases like bird flu and West Nile fever, as well as the scary Newcastle disease, which they said are velogenic. And then you have the uh, foodborne salmonella, which often take for granted, but actually has a large impact in the food industry in the Philippines. Then you have the less popular 
diseases in poultry, pet birds, and even in wild birds, uh, such as even tuberculosis, uh, parrot fever, uh, Lyme disease, and cryptosopridosiosis. Yeah, there are many tongue twister names later on. Some, of course, um, are contagious, are non contagious uh, based on the route of transmission. I'll show you that on that table on the top. Um, of course, they may be resulting in either zero or null. Uh, to low or moderate or even high risk of infection for humans. So on the top of there, you have table two, which is taken from uh, a paper by Bosseret in 2013. Um, he uh, classifies them into the contagious and non-contagious. Of course, the non-contagious would be Lyme disease uh, because you need the vector to get that. Um, so it's vector borne. And then you have the ones which have the contagious ones are uh, Chlamydophilosis, which is power fever, then have tuberculosis, West Nile fever, and cryptosporidiosis. So they have differences in terms of whether they are direct, indirect, or vector borne. Okay, for the viral uh, types of zoonosis, uh, of course, the most popular would be uh, avian influenza or bird flu. Uh, we recognize it as the highly pathogenic A. Even with influenza A or HBAI H5N1, uh, caused by the type A influenza virus, it's a orth orthomyxoviridae subtype, uh, based on the combinations of course, 16 hemagglutinin and 9 neuraminidase antigens. And that's where you get the uh, H and the N. So there's 16 of uh, uh, the subtypes. H and then nine of the N, and then you have that combination of H5 and N1. Um, then you have West Nile virus. I'm not going to go for the details of this. We have, we have to go through a lot more different diseases. Um, there's been a lot of talk about um, avian influenza uh, in the Philippines now that we actually have it. Um, for a long time, we didn't have uh, H5N1, but of course now it's in the Philippines. As for West Nile virus, it's a single-stranded RNA uh, flavivirus, uh, part of the Japanese encephalitis antigenic complex. It is a arbovirus, meaning it's arthropod-borne, so it's transmitted through a mosquito bite, particularly the culex. Oh yes, um, by, apart from the uh, highly pathogenic even influenza, there is occurring uh, uh, H5N1 occurring in low pathogenic form, which infects poultry and wild birds. And it's often recognized that uh, waterfowl and shorebirds are uh, known reservoirs of uh, low, pa low pathogenic AI. Then you have the uh, Newcastle disease or velogenic Newcastle disease. There's actually velogenic and lentogenic. Uh, Newcastle's disease. Velogenic means that it is a denoting the virulence of the virus, uh, where it, uh, it requires a short incubation time, while lentogenic requires a longer incubation time. So it's a type of avian pneumoencephalitis. It's from an avian pyromyxovirus. Um, yes, I'll, I'll go further on the details of Newcastle. This does occur uh, widely in around the world. Um, then you have avian bornavirus. It is a orthobornavirus, a uh, part of the, it causes uh, provitri uh, proventricular dilation disease, or sometimes called the macaw wasting syndrome. So there have been, uh, uh, are the avian bornavirus also occurs in other species, uh, including waterfowl. So there's actually, this is a mute swan. In Canada, they actually found uh, serum antibodies. It's usually used as a lysis system, system for this uh, on uh, uh, Canadian waterfowl, including the mute swan. And then you have St. Louis encephalitis, which is a group B virus, uh, which of course uses mosquitoes as vectors, and you find them in pigeons and finches. Then we go to the bacterial uh, zoonosis. Um, most popular would be uh, chlamydophilus, there's a lot of names, chlamydophilosis or chlamydiosis. I think it's easier to pronounce cytokosis and ornithosis or plain late's parrot fever. Um, 
uh, the, because of the difference in terms of the use of the genus Chlamydia, of course, now we often use Chlamydophila. Uh, so Chlamydophila cytosai is the A bacterial agent, which causes parrot fever. They're all, we're often associated with uh, cytosines or parrots, but also occurs in other birds, such as uh, passerines, canaries. Then you have salmon salmonellosis which is, of course, the result of infection or diarrhea from salmonella. There's several uh, subtypes and subtypes and salmonella, uh, most of which are um, acquired uh, fecal oral or through contaminated surfaces. Uh, most popular, of course, is the egg. So for those, actually, it brought me a scare during my youth because I used to eat egg yolks, yung rare na raw, ilalagay mo sa sarti. Sarap yun. But then you realize, ooh, is it salmonella free? Then you have avian tuberculosis. Uh, it is caused by uh, several species of mycobacterium. Uh, for birds, the, there's the uh, mycobacterium avium, which is actually a complex. Um, uh, it's a chronic disease, often uh, derived from fecal, oral, and of course, aerosols. There's cholibacillosis. Uh, it's caused by Escherichia coli, a gram-negative broad bacteria, of course, which uh, you can get maybe from fecal nasal secretions. Uh, continuing on with the bacterial zoonosis, we have erysipelas, um, which is a erysiplethoric uh, ruthiopathia, uh, gram-positive rod-shaped bacterium. Um, should have practiced all these pronunciations a bit earlier. And then you have pasteurellosis, an acute pneumonia from pasteurella uh, multicida, a gram negative cocobacillus, uh, um, which can, you can get by an infection through a scratch or a bite. Then you have campylobacteriosis, uh, a diarrhea caused from campylobacter. Um, again, the route, uh, the transmission route is either to contaminate surfaces or the fecal oral route. And then you have Lyme disease or Borreliosis, which you get from Borrelia bulldorferi, sensulato, um, which is uh, transmitted through a bite from the poultry mite or the red blood mite. And then you have, as well as, as the tick, and then you have the Q fever, Coxiella burnetti, DNA, which also is transmitted from bite from the red blood mite. So you know, um, I don't know if it's the right term for HANEP, but I think the HANEP and anything that you get from uh, poultry that bites you are, usually a lot of them are poultry meats. You have other like uh, lice as well. Okay, then you have the fungal zoonosis. Um, histoplasmosis is, or the Ohio River Valley river, uh, fever, which is caused by histoplasma capsulatum, uh, which is a fungi inhaled uh, from dried droppings, starlings, brackles, cowbirds, uh, red-winged or yellow-winged blackbirds, and usually what the family Icteridae, um, brackles, cowbirds, and blackbirds are Icteridae or the uh, New World War uh, blackbirds. And there's a kind of an endemic area where they have a lot more concentration in that area around Ohio. That's why it's named after the Ohio River Valley fever. Cryptococcosis is a fungal disease caused by Cryptococcus neoformans and Cryptococcus gatti, uh, which uh, can be a yeast that you can inhale from dried guano of asymptomatic pigeons. Yes, there are asymptomatic birds. Uh, pigeons, starlings, parrots, raptors, actually a lot more other kinds of birds. So it's wide more uh, infection of different species. Then you have aspergillosis. Um, um, this is a fungal infection um, caused by the, the, the fungi aspergillus fumigatis. And I put out a picture of a seagull because it's often associated with raptors. Then you have the protozoal zoonosis. Um, there's four here, uh, sarcocystis. Uh, infection caused by a parasitic protozoa sarcocystis uh, falpichula. Uh, associated with an acute fatal disease among parrots or the cytosines. And then you have giardiosis, 
a diarrhea caused by an intestinal parasite, Georgia. We have cryptosospridoliosis, diarrhea caused by the parasite, a apicomplexin, a microscopic apicomplexin, cryptosporidium. And lastly, you have toxoplasmosis, uh, which is in humans, um, it's more popular because it causes either congenital malformations or abortions, um, but it's often um, found through a cat and civet cycle. So toxoplasma gondii you find in cats and humans, but also transmitted, uh, transmission occurs in finches and sparrows. And then you have the ectoparasitic zoonosis. So ecto then endo later. Um, ectoparasites um, yeah, can be transferred from birds to humans, and then they carry all these other diseases as well as the bites can uh, cause uh, some kind of dermatitis. So bird mites, for example, uh, they're uh, blood-sucking parasitic arthropods of wild and domestic birds. You should find them in pigeons, study the feral pigeons or domestic pigeons, starlings, poultry. Um, you have the northern fowl of the white poultry mite, uh, Ornithonisus silva, uh, silviarum. And then you have the tropical fowl mite, Ornithonisus bursa. And then the more popular red blood mite, the poultry mite or the chicken mite, uh, Dermanisus gallinae. So what do they cause? So their bites, although they're relatively harmless, uh, they're irritating, itchy, they cause papules. So they look like, much like a, a really bad rash uh, by these bites, but some of them can cause lesions. So they're called pruritic dermatitis. Of course, if there's a lot, then you have ugly skin and it's itchy, so it becomes worse. And of course, then you get infection after it and then it becomes far worse. So the chicken mite, it can also be a vector for nine pathogenic bacteria, uh, and three viruses in birds. Um, I don't they come across a lot of papers how they actually were the cause of a lot of uh, severe cases of epidemics. Um, Dermaniciosis is a term for that particular kind of dermatitis that you get from decaling. So yes, this is a example of a European styling known to be a carrier of this, uh, of, um, uh, the, the red blood mite and often causes because they um, nest around houses and when the, the nest has nestlings, there's an excess of mites. They sometimes fall if you have you know, butas butas in your ceiling and then they fall into your bed and then you get the red blood mites in, either in your couch or in your sofa or in your house. But birds are associated with over 50 kinds of vector parasites. So of course anything can, well, but these are so, the ones so far that have been known to be zoonotic. Uh, to extend to on the types of ectoparasites, there's the bird tick, there's actually just two sets. The one is, of course, the more popular pigeon tick or the European pigeon tick, Argus ref, uh, reflexus, which is a hemidophagus parasite of, our, uh, of pigeons, uh, often associated with this pigeon, uh, Columbia divia, or the domestic pigeon, also known as the feral pigeon. The, the bites uh, are the result of the skin lesions. Uh, there's a strong inflammation. Uh, caused by, I think, more of a reaction to the tick saliva. So they become like purplish papules, and sometimes they become necrotic, and they may lead to either local or systemic reactions. The problem is if you get repeated bites uh, from the pigeon dick, you may develop some sort of allergy, this LGE-mediated allergy, and that, that extreme case may lead to anaphylactic shock. There's also another tick, Ixodes ricinus and Ixodes scapularis, uh, they're known to transmit Lyme disease via their bite. So the yung vector born kanina for the Lyme disease. There are some uh, diseases sometimes associated with birds, uh, but are not necessarily zoonotic. So these are just um, associated because they're uh, often because resulting from birds themselves. So it's usually a hypersensitivity pneumonitis some sort of asthma that is extreme, and then you have the allergic alveolitis. Sometimes they're interchanged between these papers, but I know they're quite different from each other uh, in terms of inflammation. So one is irritation and inflammation of the lung tissue resulting from a, an allergic reaction. What do the proteins um, occurring uh, in either the inhaled flakes of skin, which is called dander, 
or the fine particles of frayed feathers. The feathers, of course, deteriorate and become feather dust. Hindi po fairy dust, uh, feather dust. Makamagtanap kayo ng ibon kasi maging Peter Pan. Um, and also from dried droppings of, of birds, so doves, parrots, poultry. So there's a lot of names, we get this, a lot of names associated with this hypersensitivity. So if you are often associated with people working with birds directly, uh, sometimes called the bird breeders or bird fanciers lung, BFL. And then you have the parakeet fanciers lung, BFL. So then you have the pigeon lung disease. So if you're working with pigeons more often, then you get pigeon lung disease. If you work with parakeets more often, you get parakeet fanciers lung. And if you work with budgies or bajaggers or parakeets, then it's a parakeet dander pneumoconiosis. Or the acute sitako keraton pneumoconiosis. Uh, say that 50 times faster. For the endoparasites, um, there's actually just one or two. Well, the two of them are not as severely zoonotic as the other one. So one is actually more important or more known as uh, recognized as a, a zoonotic disease for between human, uh, birds and humans. Intestinal capillaries, uh, which is a, a disease caused by a parasitic nematode, uh, capillaria, uh, which occurs because this is an intermediate host, is freshwater fish. And then, of course, they, uh, the definitive host is fish eating birds. And of course, us, uh, we like to eat fish as well. Um, like birds, the fish eating birds, we like to eat them raw. So, um, especially when we eat raw, kill a wind and transmit it to humans. So it's amazing because Capillaria filipinensis was first discovered in, or recognized in the Philippines um, because of our yeah, we like to eat something raw, fish. Um, there's a paper that actually uh, reported in Taiwan um, in 1989, and they associated uh, intestinal capillaries with, uh, the, I mean, the natural host of capillaria filipinensis as the bubble ibis, ibis, which is the cattle egret, which is the egret you see all around campus that is white. Um, and then you have the night heron, slipticorax, and the uh, Chinese heron, exobrichus sinensis. So this is a, a getasarca on the picture, which is the Pacific uh, reef heron. Then you have another nematode, uh, young, uh, Eustrongrides, which causes eustrongliosis. Um, the, it's more complex because it has uh, three hosts. Uh, it goes through an invertebrate, the two vertebrates. So it goes through the oliquitic worm, uh, which is found in freshwater. Then it goes to fish. And of course, the fish is just eaten by birds. And then, of course, humans came in to eat fish, um, but also eat birds. And so you got into the mix of that complex life cycle. Toxocariasis um, is caused by the parasitic groundwater toxocara. There's uh, two species, of course, one in dogs and cats, and of course, humans being involved in that zoonotic cycle. Um, birds are not necessarily part of that same cycle, although they regard birds at what they call the paratenic coast. So they help spread. Uh, the, uh, the infective stage. So ground feeding pigeons, starlings, sparrows, you find in, especially if, if the dogs and cats would defecate or even humans defecate in the park, they would leave out the, the eggs. And of course the pigeons, starlings and sparrows will carry the eggs into their feet and beaks and deposit them uh, away from the original source. So they are known as the paratenic host. So knowing that there are a lot of this amazing um, enumeration of different um, zoonotic diseases from birds around the world, it's actually quite a few from the Philippines. So we enumerate several of those zoonotic diseases so far associated with birds in the Philippines and then humans. So of course the most popular would be avian influenza and then we end up with capillaria. Um, they're often based on case studies that we found on population medical and veterinary diagnosis. There's a lot of them online, um, although I, I think there's a lot more unpublished material we need to get to. Uh, and again, there's a lot, uh, a, a lot more studies are needed between this. So I think it's high time, it's, it's quite timely that we have the UPLB Zoonosis Center.
So this includes confirmed infections of uh, diseases such as psittacosis, Newcastle's disease, aspergillosis, and toxoplasmiosis on Philippine birds, or Philippine wildlife for that matter, and it's inferior to both humans and non avian vertebrates. Of course, because there's a lot of things happening in the Philippines, which puts us in contact with birds, including the illegal pet trade. Okay, first, then it's hard to find uh, material to, to include, so of course you get these false news. Uh, so one is West Nile fever and cephalitis, uh, infection of the brain caused by the West Nile virus, as I mentioned the flappy virus found in Africa, Asia, transmitted by mosquitoes from blood of infected birds. So there was one news item that came out, I think 2002, that West Nile virus was reported in the Philippines from the sudden family infected in Normock City, and it was published or it was reported by the University of Florida. And of course, the DOH later dis dismissed it as because of the similarities within the Flavi virus group, again, within the same complex. Uh, so it was possibly it was Japanese bee and stuff like that, which of course occurs in the Philippines. So it, so again, they wanted to put out, the DOH wanted to put out that there is no known case of West Nile. Uh, virus infection in entire Philippines so far. Okay, cytokosis. This guy could put me uh, quite surprised because I always know, I have known about cytokosis for some time, um, but I've kept uh, pet birds, mostly parakeets and parrots before. But then again, it never always dawned to me, oh, why well, not? They might get cytokosis and what happens if you go, you know, Hold and of course, I had trained parrots before uh, that you can handle. So, you know, you did a contact me if it's not this one. Anyway, um, so there are studies on cytokosis in the Philippines. Uh, Maluping et al. 2007 uh, first detected the chlamydophila cytosine um, using the ELISA test. Um, so, they found the antibodies uh, from several captive birds um, in the Nino Aquino Parks and Wildlife Center, which is a rescue center. So, so it's a lot of um, confiscated birds that's come into the rescue center, and of course, they need to be tested and been quarantined. So it's again, it's an amazing laboratory for studies, uh, especially for um, uh, wildlife medicine. Uh, Paris in 2012 detected um, uh, chlamydophila and antibodies in the blood serum of captive Philippine eagle owls, again, using the ELISA test, um, also from the rescue center. And then Salazar in 2018 detected the first uh, for the cytosines, of course, being a cytokosis, um, uh, from the antibodies of the blue nape parts, also from the rescue center. So they all tested positive, but unusually it was always in low uh, value. Uh, so at the time, even though it had a positive response, there was no current infection. So it's amazing that these birds can actually um, get infected but recover from that infection. Um, even though that we, we recognize that uh, parrots or citizens are highly sensitive to this pathogen. It's always alarming because, uh, especially with the illegal pet trade, a lot of these populations are dwindling. So, you know, effects of threat and you also have the effect of disease. Salmonellosis, um, it's always been an issue in the Philippines. Um, uh, especially because it's a major culprit for human food poisoning in the Philippines. It also is fatal from an extreme point of view. Um, so it's the bacteria of the genus Salmonella found in intestinal tracts of birds, mammals, reptiles. And of course, the infection causes the infection of the lung uh, through the, GI, the digestive tract. Um, in the U.S., there's a species, Tethymurum, which is common among wild birds and waterfowl. And it's often associated with causing the death in songbirds. So it's a sort of same thing as poisoning in songbirds. Um, Lapus uh, was able to isolate uh, Salmonella antibica, subspecies enterica, cerovar and pteroditis. <laughs> and these uh, Salmonella enterica, subspecies enterica, cerovar infantis uh, from layer hens in three sets of commercial layer farms uh, in the Philippines. Uh, they actually did a more of a study of how much uh, of the salmon that occurs between farms with high infestation of rodents and those with low infestation of rodents, of course, they found them both. They found more associated with higher um, infestation of rodents. 
Then you have Newcastle's disease. I think this one is more, uh, it needs further attention. Um, uh, there, there was a study done in, I think it was 1986, uh, where they tried to find uh, uh, the visotrophic velogenic uh, Newcastle's disease in the Philippines, so it was a chest. So they went around and looked into non cytosine and cytosine or parrots, as well as domestic chickens. So they used uh, swabs of uh, the cloaca, so cloacal samples of 728 birds. Um, and they only isolated one from a single chicken, and all the other birds were negative of this uh, visitotropic velogenic Newcastle disease. So that's like interesting, yes, there's one positive, but it's not as widespread in, um, in terms of uh, infection. Um, then, of course, there's the study on um, 42 captive raptors, uh, an amazing study in 2016 uh, by, of course, uh, Dr. Lastica Ternura. Uh, see here uh, on the top there, um, a serological and molecular detection of the Newcastle disease virus uh, done in 42 captive raptors uh, around these different wildlife rescue centers, mostly from the uh, New York Indian Parks and Wildlife Center. And they found out that uh, 16 out of the 42 tested positive for the antibodies of Newcastle's disease. Um, so that's 38%. That's quite a large uh, well, it's not half, but still quite a considerable amount in terms of uh, percentage. And what's surprising was which species were infected by Newcastle. So there, uh, the Braminikites, uh, five Braminikites, uh, white-bellied uh, sea eagle, changeable hawk eagle, Philippine hawk eagle, crested serpent eagle, black kite, crested boss hawk, and finally Philippine eagle. So Philippine eagle actually tested positive for Newcastle disease. And if you look at it, there's at least three, two species which are, of course, in the threatened list uh, of raptors. So that's quite alarming. But the, uh, the discussion um, of the paper uh, points out that the, the birds were able to overcome or recover from that infection. So it means there is the inherent ability of our wildlife to adapt to that particular infection. Then you have aspergillosis. Um, I remember work uh, going up to the Raptor Center, which was still in Mount Makiding, and there's always an issue of aspergillosis there uh, because of the uh, damp, humid conditions underneath the rainforest. Of course, most of the cages uh, around the raptor center were underneath the canopy. So that actually causes more of that uh, environment very suitable for fungal infections. So the fungal ball of Aspergillus fumigatus um, um, in the human lungs may can only cause about uh, some sort of coughing, but of course it may be severe and cause bleeding. Um, in birds, it's the infection causes severe era, nodules and plaques around uh, part of the respiratory system, from so the lungs, to the air sacs, and to the trachea, and then up to the peritoneal cavity. So in the Philippines, it's best reported from the Philippine cockatoo, so enzootic aspergillosis was reported from the Philippine cockatoo. Uh, there, I know there was a report of aspergillosis um, from Philippine eagles, so especially for birds and other raptors kept in captivity. And I think even from those which were recently rescued, they still suffer from aspergillosis. I think also probably because of the handling and uh, being stuffed in a box. Um, so there's a case study here uh, showing you an example of those nodules and see there number one, the sporangium and fungal hyphae um, of a lung from the Philippine hawk eagle. So both the Philippine hawk eagle and of course the Philippine eagle are endemic and endangered. So there's a lot of concern in terms of these impacts of aspergillosis on our Philippine wildlife. Uh, toxoplasmosis. Um, again, Toxoplasma plasma guandai is the globally known protozoan parasite for humans. And of course, cat being part of the cycle. Uh, it's also an important pathogen for birds, especially pet birds, uh, canaries, finches, bajeri birds, or budgies. Budgies are what we call lovebirds in the Philippines. Uh, it's a long story about that, but yeah, we've better to call them budgies to differentiate from 
from these birds on the picture, which are the African lovebirds, Agapornis. Uh, taxo uh, toxoplasma has been detected in captive uh, Philippine civets, so they're more associated with carnivores, uh, such as Vivera tangalunga, uh, Arctic pinturong, and Paradoxus hermaphroditus, so uh, Musang da alamid na binturong. Um, so they use the test uh, for domestic cat, the, the immunochrome uh, ELISA feline toxoplasma and can be the feed antibody test uh, on the blood serum of the civets, uh, which of course tested positive, but there were no known infections reported for captive birds in the Philippines. So but again, knowing that they are positive to toxoplasma, there's that routing where you can easily jump uh, into birds. Especially with a lot of the species included here, are often put together in the same area, especially in a rescue center. Then you have intestinal capillaries, uh, which is considered a zoonotic disease of migratory fish-eating birds. Um, the parasitic infection is caused by the nematode Capillaria filipinensis. Again, first appeared in the Philippines, of course, it went on to uh, other parts of Asia. But the infection is well known in the Philippines and in Thailand. The eggs from the feces uh, of birds and even humans disseminated along flyways over rivers, um, infect freshwater fish. In turn, these eggs are, uh, the fish are eaten raw, or which has the larva inside it, uh, by birds and course humans. Uh, yeah, stop eating raw and uncooked food. So the larva migrate to your intestine, where they become, they mature and become the adult worms. And of course, later on, come down into your colon where they lay eggs and then you repeat back the cycle. So again, if you poop poop in the river, it becomes ingested by fish again. So the cycle goes on. And sometimes you get what we call hyperinfection. So the eggs laid by the adult worms in your intestine or hatch directly to the larva. So you don't need to eat raw fish anymore. You just get reinfected by yourself. Avian influenza. So AI um, is quite significant globally. And for the longest time, the Philippines was bird flu free. And actually, if you remember this, uh, there's this on the right side, you have this poster. Habang wala pa magkahanda. I said, for the longest time, we were always bird flu free. So we're surrounded by countries all having bird flu. And it was only from later act outbreaks that occurred uh, which are usually farm related. So we, it's not from wild birds, it's not from migratory birds. Yes, they do get in, the wild birds do get infected, but because we are in an archipelagic country, it's very difficult for uh, birds to survive a infection and carry it into the Philippines. So um, actually I wrote a paper called Maintaining a Bird Flu Free Philippines, and emphasis on the conservation issue, safeguarding birds from potential impacts of danger. It's more actually more about a geographic paper, how we actually recognize the many islands and that it's difficult. There's a lot of and wild birds which are endemic, or and of course do not cross different islands. And it's more of the migratory species, but again, they take a long time to so do along the flyways. So the likelihood of getting infected by a bird, a wild bird is uh, minimal. But this goes to, these, to ensure that these pathogenic events in wildlife are investigated and approaches to prevention are formulated uh, to promote conservation. So we need to understand it better before we panic and know and, and find out whether the, which populations are actually uh, infected before we uh, post judgment on wild birds. But yes, the infections do occur on, mostly on farm related species. Okay, so the first uh, avian influence in the Philippines was uh, 2005, I think, yeah, 2005. So Philippines previously free of avian pests spread rapidly. So there was an announcement of H5 strain on ducks associated in the town of Bulacan. But although the birds were asymptomatic, this disease, of course, they tested positive for the disease. So. Now that we have one, it's somewhat controlled, but again, because of the pandemic, uh, there's kind of two sets of areas, whether you worry about COVID-19 or do you worry about AI. So in 2017, there was an outbreak of highly pathogenic avian influenza. 
in Pampanga, in Nebaisiat, it's all over the news. Um, so we'll actually reiterate that local incidence of AI after long case periods of negative. So we're, we're okay with having uh, no cases, but of course we still have this global pandemic and we look at the implications of how we recognize which pandemic we worry about, especially for both public health and health and well-being. So fortunately, uh, we're not bird flu free for that matter. We're still having bird flu. So the Department of Action actually, actually confirmed detecting uh, the highly pathogenic avian influenza outbreak and several farms in Rizal uh, uh, last September 4. Although I think it was still August that they reported it, but it was confirmed in September 4. Okay. And okay. and no confirmed, but so far there are no confirmed cases on wild birds. Okay, over there, Marawako. Thank you. So, um, to quickly move on to the end, um, what are the impacts of these zoonoses in the Philippines? So, what we think is about uh, there's a lot of critically endangered species in the Philippines, such as the Philippine eagle, the Sulu hornbill, the Negrus bleeding heart, the Philippine cockatoo, and of course, the Cebu flower, because there's less than 20 in the world. What would these impacts in terms of transmission, of course? Uh, in terms of what happens with human negligence. So to quickly wrap up, I'll go through, yeah, quickly with the biosafety protocols. I think it's important for us to look at the guidelines for testing, quarantine, and for safe transport of uh, poultry and pet birds. And of course, precautions against uh, transmission between birds and other wildlife. And for us in the uh, ornithologists in the field, I think we need to understand that we do are uh, affected by uh, these different zoonoses because we handle birds and prepare specimens, blood and tissues. So we need to, to look into potentials of, uh, by look at the bi-safety protocols that are effective for us. And we'd like to reiterate those repercussions of these zoonotic diseases, diseases that are actually trend caused by anthropogenic impacts. So prevention is key and it's both us to follow by safety protocols and strict quarantine, not only to protect Filipinos, but also Philippine birds. Just quickly, just to put up some definitions, again with zoonosis. Anthroponosis is disease transmitted from humans to humans, but there is also what we call reverse zoonosis, disease reservoirs in humans that are capable of transmission to animals, including birds. And that is one thing that happened in a bird, I think that in the Philippines, it is a, a parrot that uh, was infected by human and tuberculosis. So they passed on from the pet owner to the parrot. So, and again, vice versa. There's things that we need to consider in terms of, so again, don't touch the birdie. And, um, with this uh, issues and zoonosis, uh, I give you uh, uh, I say uh, keep safe, everyone. And uh, go that here. Yeah. Thank you. And I give you back to Letty. Thank you very much, Dr. JC, for that very comprehensive and kind of mind-boggling. <laughs> information package uh, it's really full of uh, information you have put it really short and um compact and um sure. yeah typical of you everything goes in there and everything is made uh, easily accessible thank you really um we have some questions uh, i think um i hope everybody stays on um for this uh let me just read from Sheila. Our bird diseases associated with their health and or the health of their habitats or particular seasons. Sorry, I, I have to get to repeat that question. One, two, three, four questions lang naman, if we might. <laughs> you got the question? Yes, 
Are bird diseases yeah. associated with their health or health of their habitats in particular seasons? Um, yeah, I, probably because there, there are species which are migratory. Uh, so they have different seasons. And of course, the, those migratory birds are affected by uh, you know, winter and, and also, there are also differences in the amount of uh, food available, you have to migrate. So there are stresses involved. Of course, stress and food availability affects fitness and they become immunocompromised. So there may be kind of changes in terms of, of how the diseases affect them, but also because of their habitat. I think we did a study together with, with by a student of mine, um, Bianca On, who worked on hemosporidians in birds, so even, even malaria. Uh, well, most of there's three different kinds of hemosporidians but they have kind of different levels of infection. And because they occur on different altitudinal areas within Mount Banahaw, um, they do get affected in terms of uh, how much habitat is there. So kung magandang habitat, there's less prevalence. If there's more affected habitat, mas disturb, mas mataas yung prevalence. So I think it's also because of exposure to the actual vectors themselves. So yeah, I would agree that um, anthropogenic impacts of habitat and also even climate might be would be a good judge of fitness and um, these zoonotic diseases would be a, a really good proxy for measuring um, impacts on birds. Mm -hmm. The question of floor goes like uh, is the effect of certain diseases on avian species the same as uh, its infection on humans on people? Yeah. Um, oh, thank you, Mom Bergada, for that question earlier. And thank you for, for that question. Yes. <laughs> if you read through all the literature, actually, ang ganda ng pagkakalayout nila. It always says that ano yung um, infection in humans, ano yung infection in birds. And they're all always the same. They vary in terms of uh, what happens, actually. Some, of course, very similar, but some are even extremely different. And some, of course, like some birds are actually asymptomatic, and then it becomes worse. Yeah. Than but it, it, it does vary in terms of the disease. Yeah, yeah, it's just weird. It, 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 it transfers, but it's not the same. Okay, from Dr. De Chavez, uh, second to the last question. What is the most common bird zoonotic disease in the Philippines? And what species of birds are involved? Oh, good question. Um, I think it's hard to answer that because of the literature. If you're going to base it on the literature, a lot of there's actually very few, you know, said because in the end of my talk, sorry, I you know, over time, but we're actually very lucky because sadami dami ng zoonotic diseases around the world. And even with the bird flu thing um, only being recent for us, we're actually very lucky because hindi ganun kadami yung impact in terms of zoonotic diseases I'm from birds in the Philippines. Um, so it's only, I don't know if it's, it's an artifact of not enough study. I think people are studying them, especially now there's wildlife science. Uh, the veterinary medicine group are, are very active in studying this. Um, it's just a matter of, there's actually few detections. There's a lot of studies that we've shown there that, um, remember that study with the Newcastle virus? Nami nila sinampot as isang manok lang pala yung infected. So, I don't think there is actually, Salmonella maybe, because it's the one that's causing a lot of, of food poisoning, but Salmonella is more, a hygiene issue. It's not just birds. It's just because it's associated with poultry and eggs. Kaya nga, di ba, pag magluluto ko ng manok, you use the um, sangkalan for, for ah. raw manok. Dapat hugasan mo mabuti pagkatapos kasi yun, doon nakakaroon ng salmon. So, yeah, interesting question. It's a little difficult to say which is which, uh, but I think that that's why we need more studies to, to tell which is the most common. From Dr. Gay Palier, thank you, uh, Ryan, for the question. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, JC, for the informative talk on birds and their pathogens. Would be great to include zoonosis in the research roadmap for UPLD. May effort na ang UP dito, di ba? Gumawa na siya ng committee. As the role of wildlife in zoonosis is poorly understood in the country. There are many reasons. One is because of the waning number of researchers who are into wildlife diseases. Second is the difficulty to do sampling for wildlife pathogens from the field. And third is the lack of technical knowledge how to, how for, 
know-how for control strategies. So how can, here is the question, how can MNH expand its role when it comes to the role of wildlife in ecosystem health and public health? Okay, thank you, very interesting question. So as a standpoint of museums as collections, um, collections actually a repository of historical data. So if the specimens are properly stored, you can still get information from them. Whether you become a necro, you may not necro, but you get say DNA. Uh, there's a lot of, of things you can do with uh, historical DNA nowadays. You can actually trace impacts um, on certain species from early on time and then from now. So there's um, a historical record. Actually, there's people uh, taking information from species that were collected 50 years ago on a degree of infections, even within the physical uh, of the specimens themselves. Actually, yung, one of my students, uh, Nat Fabricas, uh, did her thesis on hornbills. And so, um, it's in the incidence and number of, of feather lice. And you still get feather lice from dead specimens 30, 40 years ago, and they're still in chat, although they're uh, still very identifiable. So yes, um, museums provide the information of historical specimens. Of course, uh, we also, because there's a repository of, of, of sampling, and we do expeditions, and can take in line of, of collaborating with people who do this, the, the, the actual uh, studies, and we provide the sampling for them. I was able to answer your question. Yes, 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 I think so. And uh, I don't see any more uh, questions here. Do I mm, just comment? I'm surprised no harm related. Okay, so um, maybe there are no more questions. Um, so we are about to end, but for the if you have other questions, just call Dr. JC privately or go to the museum. <laughs> so thank you very much once again, Dr. JC, for that very um, impressive and uh, comprehensive talk. Um, you are supposed to receive a certificate. I, I think it would be normally you are the one who signs. So here, who signs that is Mom Camille Meneses, the chair of the 44th anniversary committee. Yes. And so let us give a virtual round of applause to Dr. GC for having opened our minds into a very wide array of um, zoonoses in birds. And the museum will also be giving him a token of appreciation. I don't know what that is, but all those tokens are in the museum <laughs> and uh yeah this is one of my favorite animals the snakes but before i end the seminar let me give out a few a few reminders please fill out the seminar evaluation form to get your own certificate of appreciation the link is flashed on the screen and copied in the chat box please click on the link provided to evaluate the webinar we are also giving out a link of six printable souvenir cards featuring photos taken by Nat Geo photographer Joel Sartore. The link is on the screen and is also copied in the chat box. Finally, please follow UPLB Museum in all social, social media accounts. You can follow, you can also now find the UPLB Museum of Natural History in Wikipedia. This was discussed yesterday. Let us now all take a break. We hope to see you in our next seminar. We'll follow see Philip, Al Professor Philip Alviola and then Jude and then Doc Marian. Okay, so yeah, we have uh, a good day. We have a great um, learning today. So keep safe. Thank you and goodbye.